Coming up, a band from Fort Worth, Texas horrified and fascinated radio listeners with a song about a grisly plane crash. The single was widely banned from the airways for its explicit subject matter and the eerie wailing of ambulance sirens. But for the stations that dared to play it, the request lines immediately lit up like a Christmas tree. The story of a one-hit wonder, Bottle Lightning, is one of the most graphically disturbing songs ever to crack the Billboard Top 40. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the excitement of watching a world premiere video on the original MTV channel back when they actually played music, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Click the bell. Do that so that you always know when our videos drop. You can also become a VIP with more content on our Patreon. The link for that is below. So it's time for another edition of our show, Bottle Lightning, where we put a glorious one-hit wonder under the microscope and celebrate its all-time legacy. We call it Bottle Lightning rather than a one-hit wonder because the impact for many of these songs is so much more than one-time dalliance on the pop charts. Today, we're going to jump inside the DeLorean. We're going to head back to the year 1971. Uh, considered by many to be the greatest year in music history. Joni Mitchell released her mesmerizing opus, Blue. Hey, Blue. John Lennon scaled the top of the charts with his hit, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. Of course, Rod Stewart hit number one on both sides of the Atlantic with Maggie May. Other monumental albums that changed the world as we know it were What's Going On by the Immaculate Voice of Marvin Gaye. So you can see oh, what's going on, what's going on. There was also Rolling Stones, uh, their dynamite record, Sticky Fingers. Evil, I got you this way. The magnificent record, The Low Spark of High Heel Boys by Traffic. That also moved the needle. Uh, T-Rex, Electric Warrior, The Who, Who's Next, Carol King Tapestry, Pink Floyd Metal, Janis Joplin Pearl. And then at the end of the year, Led Zeppelin IV came out and <laughs> really haven't even touched the surface. The stairway to it was an incredible year to be sure. In the middle of all this greatness, a band called Blood Rock dropped their only hit, in my view, one of the most disturbing songs ever put to record. I talked about songs that, you know, really freaked me out when I was a kid, you know, either because of a weird, intimidating image on the album cover or a unique lyric that was provocative to my young ears. But as an adult, I am still creeped out by the spine-tingling DOA by Blood Rock. Let's talk about this band. So Blood Rock was from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, they began hitting the clubs in the Dallas club scene in 1963 as The Naturals, opening for some of the biggest names in popular music that toured through the market, such as the Beach Boys and uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders. In 1966, the band changed their name to Crowd Plus One, but they lost their lead guitarist and co-founder Dean Parks when he accepted the position of music director for the popular Sonny and Cher variety show. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Sonny and Cher show. <laughs> Parks was replaced by Lee Pickens, and the band changed their name once again to Blood Rock to stay. This was in 69. As Blood Rock, the group was known as a heavy metal act with psychedelic overtones. In 1971, Blood Rock released their national breakthrough LP, Blood Rock 2, featuring a chilling piece of gory pulp fiction titled DOA. And there's something in the DOA was inspired by a traumatic memory of Lee Pickens, who witnessed a deadly plane crash when he was only 17 years old. Lee had dreams of becoming an airline pilot. And on that fateful day, he had just climbed out of a plane that his friend was operating. Standing near the runway, Lee watched in horror as the plane took off. It rose 200 feet in the air and then suddenly fell to the ground, rolling end over end and crashed in a fiery heap. We were flying alone. 
Lee's friend was killed in that crash. Uh, the vision of the tragedy unfolding permanently haunted the guitarist, as if it had happened yesterday. I, mean, I can't even imagine how terrifying it would be to watch your friend die right in front of your eyes. Lee shared his vivid account of the devastation with his bandmates, and uh, they convinced him to write a song inspired by what he had experienced to work it out. <laughs> The six members of Blood Rock spun Lee's tale into the nightmare ending for a man and woman couple with the spirit of the narrator seemingly floating above his mangled body, describing what he sees, what he feels, and the chaos that surrounds him. Uh, the descriptive prose in DOA, it just paints a, a ghastly, harrowing scene. In a state of shock, the narrator clings to life, describing something warm flowing down his fingers and pain flowing through his back. He helplessly realizes his inevitable demise. Move my arm and there's no feeling. On the threshold of death, the male victim looks over at his female companion and finds her unresponsive with a distant stare. The girl I knew has such a distant stare. The most climactic part of DOA is when the narrator hears the EMT whisper softly that he's not going to make it. There's no chance for me. With his very life flowing out of his body, he begs God in heaven to put him out of his misery. Heaven, teach me how to die. The ominous atmosphere of DOA is established from the opening note with Blood Rock's keyboardist Steve Hill's uh, chilling Hammond B3 motif. The melodic uh, macabre of the track's arrangement was centered around a recreation of the tritone interval, which was produced solely by Hill's amazingly dexterity. Uh, to create the siren effect with the tritone interval, uh, Hill played the Hammond with his right hand and plucked a dirge-like uh, three-chord bass line with his left hand. The tritone interval is also referred to as the devil's interval. Uh, centuries ago, the religious leaders uh, deemed the tritone interval as too jarring to be played in churches, even going as far as labeling the passage as the soundtrack of evil. The beginning section of DOA, it's so ominous. By the time lead vocalist Jim Rutledge begins his masterful creep show narrative, we're already trembling from fear of what's gonna come next. According to Rutledge, the lyrics for the final recorded version of the song were pretty tame uh, compared to the original lyrics that Pickens had written. I guess the original lyric sheet was extremely graphic. You know, all blood and guts with the crash victims vomiting and getting their limbs ripped off, uh, pretty dark. The track was toned down for prime time as the first cut on Blood Rock 2 and edited from the LP version that was eight and a half minutes long to four and a half minutes as a single for AM radio airplay consideration. Someone lays a sheet across my chest. This was easily the most disturbing song to hit the charts in the 70s. Now, death on the pop charts, nothing new. Plenty of songs that, you know, scaled uh, the beat or the charts. Some were delivered with melodramatic storytelling, but most of them were tearjerkers that were downright depressing on paper but they were sugar-coated with bubblegum production to make them uh, more palatable, you know, for radio play. Songs like Honey by Bobby Goldsboro, that went to number one on the Billboard Hot 168, one of the biggest hits of that year. A Honey composed by Bobby Russell evoked instant blubbering for listeners with lyrics like, it was in the early spring when flowers bloom and robins sing, she went away. Early spring when flowers bloom and robins sing, she went away. And uh, one day while I was not at home, while she was there and all alone, the angels came. While she was there and all alone, the angels came. Now, as we further break down these songs, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Every day, we look at our electronics, iPads, laptops, cell phones, and uh, the digital blue light can really make your eyes tired. I know they do mine. If you go to zenny.com, you can design your own frames and make sure that you add blue blocks to protect your eyes from that light. 
it's really a game changer. Something warm is flowing down my finger. So Bobby Russell penned another number one hit in 1972 with The Night the Lights Went Out in Georgia. He actually wrote the tune with Cher in mind, but her then husband and business partner Sonny Bono passed on the song. So actually Russell gave it to his wife, uh, Vicki Lawrence from The Carol Burnett Show. It was Vicki who narrated the edge of your seat tell of a cheating wife who was murdered by her husband's little sister. You see little sister, don't miss when she aims her gun. See little sister, don't miss when she aims her gun. Pretty crazy. There was also Seasons in the Sun by Terry Jacks. That's a song that we put the spotlight uh, on uh, a few months ago. It also went to the top of the Billboard Hot 100. Verse 3 really tugged on the old heart strings when Jack sang, uh, Goodbye, Pop, it's hard to die when all the birds are singing in the sky. When all the birds are singing in the sky. Now, before Sly Stallone's iconic Rocky franchise, there was the number nine hit Rocky by Austin Roberts, about a young man named Rocky, who was madly in love with an insecure hippie girl that was diagnosed with a terminal illness shortly after their daughter's one-year birthday party. Uh, the song had a schmaltzy groove to it, but the lyrics were very tragic. Rocky, I've never had to die before. Don't know if I can do it. She said, Rocky, I've never had to die before. Also in 1975, David Geddes released uh, Run, Joey, Run, about a gun-toting father who was chasing his daughter's boyfriend for getting her pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, the song's opening verse goes like this. Daddy, please don't. It wasn't his fault. He means so much to me. Daddy, please don't. It wasn't his fault. He means so much to me. Daddy, please don't. We're gonna get married. Just you wait and see. We're gonna get married. Just you wait and see. Now, tragically, in a blind rage, the father accidentally shoots his own daughter. as when she jumps in the line of fire and she dies in her boyfriend's arms. We're gonna get married. For those who love cannibalistic gore, there was Timothy, a horror story written by Rupert Holmes, which of course we talked about earlier uh, this year. A uh, song was put to vinyl by the Bowies uh, in 1970. Uh, there was no sipping a pina colada or getting caught in the rain in Timothy. <laughs> Instead, Rupert wrote about three friends that were trapped in a caved in mine. Uh, while one of the guys lost consciousness from a lack of food, another friend sold his soul for just one piece of meat and had Timothy for dinner. Just a piece of meat. And of course, there was lighter fare before that with Dead Man's Curve and the leader of the pack. So many different songs. We should do another feature on all those songs. That's when I fell for the leader of the pack. But for straight-ahead blood and guts realism, nothing was more petrifying than Blood Rock's plane crash terrorizer. It took a great deal of courage for a radio station to play DOA. Uh, any music director that reviewed the record when it arrived at the station must have known it was going to be extremely controversial. Uh, and it certainly was. DOA was banned by many top 40 stations that refused to play it. Even the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, wanted to outlaw airplay of DOA. I mean, the explicit morbidity of the subject matter was the first issue that concerned the decision makers. The second problem was actually the sound of the sirens on the recording of DOA. Uh, the sirens on the recording sounded so real. Drivers that heard the song on the radio instinctively pulled over to the right side of the road, thinking that an active ambulance was behind them. And then there was the third issue with DOA, which was the arguable misinterpretation of the lyrics. Many believe the track was about a couple driving under the influence of LSD. In their hallucinogenic uh, stupor, they lose control of the vehicle, the car hydroplanes and violently crashes. It was the chorus that sparked conjecture about DOA being a drug song. I remember we were flying along and hit something in the air. Something in the air. Shortly after the height of the success of DOA, perhaps to diffuse the rumored drug connotation of the track and the escalating FCC pressure, 
The members of Blood Rock joined Grand Funk Railroad and other bands in an anti-drug radio campaign that year. Like a gruesome horror flick, DOA scared the hell out of listeners. But they couldn't get enough of the auditory thrill ride. A single play of the song would instantly light up the phone lines, like I said, like a Christmas tree. Top 40 DJs of the early 70s that were on the air of stations that played DOA marveled at how you know, explosive, how scorching the response was every time they played that song. For any station that dared to play it, DOA was by far the most requested song and translated into the best-selling 45 in the broadcast area, beginning in Blood Rock's hometown of Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, it's a hard 45 to come by. It didn't matter that critics panned the track as being in extremely poor taste. The press compared DOA to the stoic uh, media reporting of the carnage of the Vietnam War, as if the public had become uh, desensitized to bloodshed. Miraculously, though, the single did crack the Billboard Hot 100, actually the top 40. It peaked at number 36. I think it would have been a bona fide top 10 smash, maybe even number one, if not for the considerable airplay ban across the country. Blood Rock ended up being classified as a proverbial one-hit wonder. Uh, the follow-up LP, Blood Rock 3, that started off hot as a pistol. It, it was riding out the intrigue of DOA, but both singles from that record bombed. So after releasing six studio albums, Blood Rock called it quits finally in 1975. A rhythm guitarist Nick Taylor passed away in 2010, and uh, Steve Hill died in 2013. As a 2022 bassist had Grundy drummer Rick Cobb and uh, lead singer Jim Rutledge are still making music on one form or another. Just not as blood rock. Still, the guys have their time in the national spotlight, making one of the most hair-raising, blood-curdling songs of the entire rock era. This is a song that uh, I have to listen to with the lights on and wide awake. It definitely has my vote for the most disturbing song, not only the 70s, but Maybe of all time. What do you think? Leave us a comment about Blood Rock, about DOA. What are your memories of this song? Do you remember it? Did you have the record? Let us know in the comments below. What do you think are the most disturbing songs of all time? Uh, songs that to really make your blood curdle. Let us know. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot more. Uh, you can check out our piece on Timothy. Uh, from Rupert Holmes. Uh, I'll link to that below. And uh, make sure to subscribe to our videos below if you, if, you, if you like this. Also check us out on Patreon. We would love to have that. Uh, it's all about keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.